Welcome to Extraordinary League, an actual play RPG podcast brought to you by Smash Fiction. I'm Dan Mulcairin, your Game Master. Playing Stitch is Kit Mulcairin. Come on in, Sam, and welcome to... What? It's a different Michael Jordan? <sighs> Fine. Playing Dante is Liz Logan. I've got dunks. Great. <laughs> Let's you just base all of yours off of mine. <laughs> She's been doing it for like a year now. Just One of these days, I'm gonna I'm gonna have Liz go first, and it's really <laughs> just, gonna, <laughs> just gonna make things go crazy. Playing Sterling Archer is Miles Schneiderman. No, I I get it, Roland. It's a cool line. I'm just saying that if anyone is gazing into anything, it's me into the scope of my awesome gun. Right before I go totally ninja on somebody. Although I am potentially open to the stuff about fisting. Oh no. <laughs> Playing Luna Lovegood is Megan Bob. I don't mind sand. It's dry, <laughs> sparkly, and it makes everything look like buried treasure. Playing Morden Solis is Claire Mulcairin. Compared to my own galaxy, Eternia was a dump. But now that I've come to this plane, we just hit an all-time slump. Just look at these scruffy scoundrels, a hive full of rotten scum. If the multiverse has a center, this plane's the one it's farthest from. Whoa. On Tatooine. <laughs> on Tatooine. Skin is on fire. Never been drier. Where's my canteen? Where's my canteen? I would take any other plane. As long as they've at least heard of rain. Sandstorms of Braden. Tuscans be Raiden. On Tatooine. Oh, man. Never before have I wanted an animatic of a sequence from League more than I want the music <laughs> video for that. Previously, your plan to go out and find the fifth and final gem needed to defeat Phyrexia was put on hold when Phyrexia itself showed up at Castle Greyskull. You and the few Leaguers there managed to evacuate to another plane, where the rest of your allies are currently working against a Phyrexian plot to build a weapon that can destroy entire universes. You arrived in a cave and met up with fellow Leaguer, Michael Jordan, who yeah. told you that you are on a desert planet called Tatooine. Michael Jordan points over to a nearby overhang of rock where some sort of small open top hover vehicle rests in the shade. If you're all the last members of the league that are going to be coming over from Grayskull, we should head into town. I already sent the other leaguers ahead to the secret headquarters we maintain there, so we should be able to meet up with the rest of the team and figure out what our next step is. Luna jumps in the vehicle. Is How many rows does it have? There are three rows of seating and then a cargo compartment in the back. Third row, as long as I can, like, get a good... I don't want it to be one of those little slice windows. I want a proper window that I can, like, rubberneck out of. Well, it's it's open top, so there's no windows per se. So nothing to impede your rubbernecking. Yeah, all right. Third row. While Luna's asking for the, the car's details, like she's at a fucking dealership, <laughs> Stitch is going to jump in the w- jump and take the wheel. I had a feeling <laughs> one one of two of you would do that. Martin takes a sec to walk around and inspect it. He notices that it's just floating above the ground, but it's like perfectly still and there's no visible exhaust or anything. It's just like stuck a foot above the ground. He kind of like looks under it, puts a hand on it and tries to press it down for a sec and is like, what is, how is this? Um, never mind. And then just gets in it. Metachlorians. It's metachlorians. Yep, (laughs) metachlorians. Michael Jordan is able to uh, direct you guys in the direction of the uh, city where the League headquarters is. Stitch, you are behind the wheel. Are you doing anything uh, noteworthy, or are you actually playing responsibly for once? Is this like a pretty wide open area as as much of Tatooine? Yeah, I mean, it's it's a lot of sand, some occasional rocks. Oh yeah, I mean, is there tunes? We got tunes? Are there tunes? We got tunes? jams, if you will. Oh shit, hell yeah. <laughs> sure, I'll say that that song is coming over <laughs> the radio. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Question um, mark? Yeah, Stitch cranks the radio, um, and uh, he's going to be on the lookout for some nice sloped rocks that he can, like, ramp this baby off of. Maybe some, right. some sick donuts just to mix it up. Uh, Stitch, why don't you give me an agility check with the bonus for vehicles? <laughs> I do want to ask, does this thing have seatbelts? Oh, uh, what do you guys think? You think Star Wars land speeders no, have seatbelts? I've never seen one. Sure <laughs> yeah. not. Yeah, I'm going to say no. Can I say that the radio is actually a huge John Cusack style boombox and it's now on my shoulders? <laughs> why, why? Okay. I got a yellow on dope vehicle stunts. Well, yeah, why don't you uh, Why don't you say what sort of stunt you managed to do as you're driving through the desert? Well, we do some fucking Fast and Furious type shit. 
for no goddamn mm-hmm. reason other than Stitch is bored. So there, we definitely ramp off of uh, like a sloped rock. Maybe do some sick donuts around like uh, some beautiful rock arches. At one point, I, I pass it to Lace so she can get some fucking practice. I think Lace, compared to uh, Stitch, drives like very conservatively and defensively. <laughs> you know, like always uses her turn signal, gives plenty of space for the the person in front. There's no one in front of you guys right now. Like your journey across Tatooine is showing you this oppressively bright and hot wasteland. Every once in a while, you can pick out distant objects. Like there's a large rectangular vehicle crawling slowly off in the distance. You pass by a herd of these large furred creatures with huge curled horns. And eventually, after hours of travel, your vehicle comes up to the rim of a cliff overlooking a vast plateau below. And off in the distance, partially concealed by the shimmering heat rising off of the desert sand, is a city made of many low white or brown buildings. You can occasionally see the lights of vehicles coming down from the sky or taking off from various spots around the city. Michael Jordan looks out at this and says, Mos Eisley Spaceport. Not a great place, but it's not too bad. I mean, it's no Chicago. Anyway. (laughs) You see that building there with the the big green dome? That's uh, where we meet up and make plans. Uh, We should be able to. And then just then, there's a sudden blooming of flickering orange light as the building that Jordan was just pointing at explodes. This is followed seconds later with flashes of red laser fire beginning to flicker up from the nearby streets and figures in white armor begin to pour in towards where the domed building just stood. Michael, buddy, I hate to say it, that looks exactly like Chicago. (laughs) (laughs) He, like, rubs the back of his head and says, well, uh, yeah, I guess. It looks like we might have attracted some attention. Uh, What do you all do? Rampage! I go down to attack. Can we see anybody coming out of the building? Luna, you look down carefully. You can see that in the streets just outside the building are the other League members that just escaped Grayskull. Lara Croft, Geralt, Godzilla, Roland, Demona, Fiverr, Skeletor, and Bowsette. They are all currently pinned down and surrounded by a platoon of soldiers wearing white armor. Are, how, how far away are they? Is it like a few blocks? Is it a decent distance? You guys are still not quite in the city. Like, you're on the plateau that's overlooking the city, but you can see this fight erupting. I'm gonna try to snipe one of the walls with my portal gun right next to them. Okay. Michael Jordan sees you raising that up. Hey, just so you know, the League does have a hangar nearby with some ships docked there. Uh, We might be able to use some of those ships to pull them out of the fire. But hey, you want to go charging in? From what I've heard, you guys know what you're doing, so you do what you want to do. How many of them are down there? How many stormtroopers? Probably three to four dozen. So we'll be hit by like two of them. It's fine. Let's go. Yeah. (laughs) Okay. I think some of us can portal over there to try to hold them off and help people escape. We can, and then we can, we'll hold them down and wait for the cavalry to arrive, which will be a ship, which can pick us up. How do we feel about that? That's fine. So if we want to split into two parties, who wants to go with me to help protect the League and buy time? Archer is already halfway there. I'll go with Morden. Okay, I will go with Lace to go get a vehicle. Okay, Stitch, Luna, Lace, you guys are cool with driving the car and going to the hangar to get us some air support? (laughs) Sure. And you're stuck with me. From a distance, y'all hear somebody yell, Why is it so hard to run in sand? (laughs) (laughs) No, Michael Jordan says, I'll go with you to the hangar. I know where it is. And so he jumps back into the land speeder with Stitch, Lace, and Luna. Morton's going to make an orange portal on the wall way down, like several miles away where the league is. And then at the closest surface that will hold a portal, you know, on on some building on the uh, outskirts of Moss Alley, he's going to make a blue portal. Okay, Morden, I don't normally make you roll to shoot, but I think this is going to determine how close you're able to get. So go ahead and roll me an agility check with a bonus for ranged combat guns. That is a green. So you're able to put the portal, I'm going to say like probably about three blocks away from where the fighting is taking place. So it sounds like Morden, Dante, and eventually Archer jump in through the portal and uh, find themselves much, much closer to where this fighting is going on. While uh, Stitch, Lace, Luna, and Michael Jordan jump in the land speeder and begin to tear off in the direction of another area of town. I'm going to start with the group that is going to help the rest of the league. 
Morden, Archer, and Dante, you guys have uh, emerged from this wall into the streets of Mos Eisley. Guys, I really don't like sand. <laughs> okay, well, <laughs> duly noted. I have some bad news for you because the streets here are not paved. Uh, they are very <laughs> wide, but they are sand. It's it's packed sand, but it's still sand. It looks as though uh, most of the natives of this city have fled in the fighting, but you can see that these white-clad soldiers have poured out from other buildings. Some of them are on top of buildings and are taking shots at the members of the League from there. You can see that Skeletor and Demona are currently combining their magic to put up a force field bubble around the rest of the group, uh, helping to block the incoming storm of red blaster bolts. But from what you can see, it looks like uh, Lara, Geralt, and Roland are all sporting blackened burns from where a bolt got through. Mm -hmm. Uh, So they are fighting valiantly, but obviously in a desperate situation. Situation. Very important thing we need to establish. Um, are the streets relatively abandoned or are there, is it like really packed with random CGI background extras <laughs> like, you know, stepping in poop and stuff? I need to know which which yeah. version we're dealing with here. Right. Uh, well, at the moment, most of the natives seem to have fled from the fighting. You can kind of see them like running off in the distance away from it. But at the moment, really, the only extras that are around are the stormtroopers. Okay, that are if there's if there's firing. dewbacks in the background, are they moving or are they mm. not? I need to know if we're in special edition or not. <laughs> Let's see. I'm gonna say it's a Schrodinger's dewback. Uh, uh-huh. <laughs> there is a dewback, but it's currently hidden behind a building, and so for the time being, it is both moving and not moving. You would have to actually <laughs> look at it before it became one or the other. All right. Well. We're just going to have to see when this ship arrives, if it's CG or if it's just like a model, you know, yeah, that, exactly. that I think will will determine things pretty definitively one way or the other. So yeah, for sure. Uh, I need you all to roll initiative, please. 12. 5. 10. Morden, you are up first. As you guys are running, the first clump of enemies that you guys run into are a group of six of these white-clad soldiers. They've put uh, some overturned vehicles between themselves and the League, so they're ducking behind cover, occasionally popping up to take a few shots before ducking back down. In addition to the six of them, there's also a pair of human males that are wearing gray double-breasted military officers' uniforms with a belt, a cap, and tall black boots, and they are occasionally directing these armored soldiers fire uh, as they continue their distant assault of the League. So there are six stormtroopers and two officers. How many could I get with an area incinerate? These guys are relatively spread out. Uh, I'm going to say they're like split into thirds. There's two groups with two stormtroopers and one officer each, and then one group that's just two stormtroopers. So you could target any one of those three groups. Sure. I'll try to hit one of the groups that has an officer in it with an incinerate. That is a yellow. What? I know, it happens sometimes. What does that mean? Does that mean you only miss by a little? (laughs) (laughs) Those three Imperials get only the briefest glimpse of their impending destruction before they are impendingly destroyed. All three of them are gone. Oh, dang. Nice. Wow. The remaining four stormtroopers whirl around uh, seeing this unexpected rear assault coming at them, and they all begin to open fire on the three of you. The stormtroopers that are targeting Archer and Dante fire this, like, flurry of laser bolts, and man, you guys have no idea what they were aiming for. Like, (laughs) it must have been on a distant planet. Maybe, like, there's another league cell on the other side of the city that they were shooting at, because it was not anywhere close to you. Morden, uh, the two that end up shooting at you actually do manage to score some hits. Uh, So both of them hit your force field, which deals a total of 30 damage. It is still up. Dante, we are up to you now. I forgot I had the boom box. So I, I don't know if this is possible. I'm probably not smart enough for this, but can I tune it to a frequency that screws with their radios? Uh, yeah, <laughs> go ahead and roll reason for me, Dante. Dante's just like sitting there tuning. <laughs> oh my God, it's a green. No, it does not. Damn it. <laughs> You managed to pick up a song that it's kind of fuzzy. You think it's, they're saying Jedi rocks. It sounds real weird. You're not digging it at all, but the stormtroopers seem uh, completely unfazed by it. That brings us to Archer. What would you like to do? I have to to get this out of the way first, actually, before I do this. I received recently an affidavit uh, via direct message on Twitter Uh from from one Neil Butler explaining to me that uh, traditionally when one fires the the lawgiver, which is now the cog- the cogiver of course, one uh, shouts out the name of the kind of uh, ammunition one is using for it. Oh. Yes, yes, of course. So that will be that will be standard procedure going forward. So uh, I am going to uh, shout armor piercing. 
and uh, shoot one of the four stormtroopers. Um, well, that was a... I just rolled a two, so that's a white. You just kind of assume that, you know, the opening salvo has to miss on this world. You figure it must be like a tradition or something. So, you know, you're you're ready after this, of course, but... I'm not worried about it, yeah. Yeah, traditions must be respected. Sure, of course. In the meantime, the Imperial officer draws a blaster pistol and is going to also fire at Morden. Morden, the blaster bolt is heading directly for you and hits you for 15 damage. Shield down. What would you like to do, Morden? What sort of junk can I uh, gravity gun at them nearby? I mean, there's all sorts of uh, detritus and debris around here. They've uh, overturned vehicles to use as cover. There's uh, pieces of rubble and debris lying around from where stray blaster bolts have like hit the side of a building or hit a vehicle or something like that. So there's all sorts of uh, stuff that you can make use of. All right. I noticed sitting by the side of a building are a pile of uh, power converters. Okay. Don't ask what they look like. I pick them up with the gravity gun and fire a bunch of uh, junk at one of the officers. That's a white. All right, uh, goes flying wide. These stormtroopers are continuing their fire. Dante, you are getting hit by a stormtrooper blaster bolt. No. You end up taking 15 damage. Archer, your opponent is extremely honorable and is obviously allowing you to take the first shot. Right. I mean, I, that's how it works on this world. Yeah, clearly. absolutely. Uh, so you're doing just fine. I, admi- I admire your commitment to the rules of combat. <laughs> <laughs> Morden, you see this like flurry of blaster bolts heading towards you. Dante and Archer, the two of you see Morden basically vanish beneath this hail of lasers. Oh, dang. Dante, it is your turn. So I'm going to take my boombox, throw it into the air, actually take out my sword and baseball bat it at the Okay. <laughs> nice. You're inspired by your new ally, Michael Jordan. And if there's any way I could get like a grenade stuck in the boombox, that'd be great too. But <laughs> I don't know if that's possible. I, it's theoretically possible. I just don't like, just I don't, don't understand the causality between all of this, but okay. Uh, it's a yellow. Were you uh, aiming for one of the stormtroopers? The ones in the back, in the hopes that they lose their footing and shoot the ones in the front. I mean, they're all basically standing in more or less a line, but okay, you take out the backmost one. But he does indeed go down under the furious assaults of your flying boombox attack. Archer, we are up to you. What would you like to do? All right, I'm going to switch over to uh, High X, as they called it in uh, in Mega City 1. And I will... Are there... Is there a group still, or are they spread out or what? Yes, there is still one group of two stormtroopers and one officer, and then there's one stormtrooper kind of standing off by himself. And those two are the ones firing on Morden, right? Yes. Okay, those are the ones getting a high explosive round. <laughs> Sounds good. Before I was raptured away. <laughs> That's right. Oh. <laughs> Apparently. All right, that is a green. Archer, your high explosive round lands directly in front of this group of Imperials, and it detonates. You hear a simultaneous triple cry of this, like, weird, identical, like, falsetto (laughs) yell. (laughs) Yeah. As the three of them go flying through the air, over above their cover, flipping, smoking through the air. The remaining officer and two of the stormtroopers are down. That just leaves the one stormtrooper. Uh, I mean, he's gonna keep shooting. We'll just see. No, he misses. He misses very, very badly. Uh, Dante, what would you like to do? Dante, you should hold your action. We should go at the same time. Okay. Yeah, so we just like both like run at him slow motion. All right, closing, cool. Closing in melee distance. Yeah, uh, both of you roll a fighting check. Oh, no, that's that's a, another yellow. I got a yellow as well. All right, yeah, the two of you do a simultaneous double clothesline to this poor guy. Yes. And uh, he drops to the ground and is completely out of the fight. The two of you have cleared out your Imperial opposition, but you turn and look back. Oh my God, Morden. There is no sign of Morden. Switching over to the other side of town. So Stitch, you pilot the land speeder through the streets of Mos Eisley and eventually come up to a wide, low building with a large circular opening in the roof. Uh, Michael Jordan explains to you that this is the hangar where the League store the several spaceships that they keep on uh, this planet for when they need to make excursions. What would you like to do? Oh, well, we should go in. Stitch is going to um, pass the driving off to Lace for this so he can be ready to act in case uh, shit goes down. So Lace is going to take the wheel. Wexter, I believe, is still here. He's gonna he's gonna be sitting in like Lace's lap equivalent. Aww. Is she letting him pretend like he's driving? 
Yes, absolutely. <laughs> He's got yes. his, his tiny T-Rex arms on the very bottom of the wheel, and it's <laughs> yeah. really hard to reach. So as you guys are pulling up in front of the hangar, you suddenly see coming from a, a corner down the street are a pair of white-clad stormtroopers, as well as a third one that is mounted on a vehicle that kind of has like the profile of a motorcycle, but it's like a hover vehicle, so there's no actual wheels. Behind you, you can see a similar group emerge. So another two stormtroopers and then a third on top of this like hover bike. And then you see popping up from the roof of the building are two more stormtroopers that have rifles. So basically there's eight stormtroopers all together that have surrounded you as you approach the hangar, two of which are on these uh, hover cycles. So let's go ahead and roll some initiative for you guys. Two. 10. Who would like to control Michael Jordan? I mean, I would also be willing to. Miles, you are now controlling Michael Jordan. I just sent you his character sheet. Okay, Luna, you're up first. What would you like to do? Uh, this is such a bad idea, but I'm going to do it anyway. I am going to throw a cheering charm at one on a motorcycle, because, I don't know, maybe he's going to switch sides. That's my hope. Ugh, a white. Oh, no. There's no room in the Empire for positivity and <laughs> happiness. <laughs> So it hits him, but does nothing. The stormtrooper wouldn't even know what to do with those feelings. Oh, tragic. All right, that brings us to Michael Jordan. You know, I offered to, I volunteered to play this character because, uh, you know, I, I know more about Michael Jordan. Thought I could come up with some interesting ways to attack. Uh, I did not expect to see this particular list of powers and abilities. <laughs> uh-huh. Michael Jordan's going to take out his basketball. <laughs> and it's a, it's, a, it's a ricochet basketball. So, Dan, that's a green. Okay. Which uh, stormtrooper are you aiming for? One of the ones on foot or one of the ones on the uh, hover bike? On the bike. Uh, so Michael Jordan hurls his basketball and nails one of the ones on the uh, hover bike right in the helmet, and he drops off limply. So that's one down. Yeah, so we got another attack here. Mm-hmm, because it's a ricochet ball. That is a yet, uh, no, green. One of the uh, stormtroopers on foot gets hit and also goes down. The ball continues to ricochet. That's another green. Yes. All right. yes. The third and final stormtrooper in that group goes down, and the ball continues to ricochet. Oh my god, he's the greatest of us. Okay, that's a, that's a white. The ball ricochets uh, several times before flying back into Michael Jordan's palm, and he keeps on dribbling, uh, looking for his next target. Oh my god. There is one stormtrooper left on the hover bike. He is going to fire the blaster cannon on the front of it, and he is shooting at Stitch. Stitch, you get hit with a large blaster bolt for 25 damage. Uh, ow. The remaining four stormtroopers are going to divide their fire between Michael Jordan and Luna. Each of you gets hit for 15 damage. So Luna, that does not get through your Patronus shield. Which then brings us to Stitch. Stitch is going to yell at Lace. Punch it, Lace! Right through the 5-0! And he's going to basically signal to her to basically just, like, hit it. Just, like, fucking drive forward. Um, as the car passes, the, the other stormtrooper that's still on his hover bike, Stitch is going to try to tackle him. Like, basically dropkick him right off the bike so he could steal it. Uh, that's a yellow. Lace whips the uh, land speeder around. You go flying off it and demolish this stormtrooper. Uh, he falls to the sand below, and you are now sitting pretty on a hover bike. Thanks for the bye. Luna, it is your turn. Uh, so there are four stormtroopers left. There are two on foot and two on the roof. What would you like to do? I'm going to cast Avis at the ones on the roof. So I'm going to summon whatever flock of birds is nearest to uh, mm. hopefully take them out. That is a yellow. The two stormtroopers on the roof are suddenly taken completely out by an unexpected swarm of womp bats. We're going to say <laughs> womp bats. Michael Jordan, it is your turn. There are two stormtroopers on foot left. I'm going to run up to one of them, jump up super high in the air, and dunk the ball on his head. Yellow. Yep, there is a very satisfying dunk as the mm -hmm. ball cracks the helmet of the stormtrooper who drops unconscious to the ground and you catch the ball on the rebound. The remaining stormtrooper turns to you in a panic and begins firing bolt after bolt at you, all of which go sailing past you. I dribble through the crossfire menacingly. <laughs> all right, Stitch, uh, you are on your brand new bike. What would you like to do? Um, so Lace is going to continue to just keep going for this hangar. Um, are there more stormtroopers uh, like pursuing or getting in front of the car? There is one stormtrooper left. He looks very intimidated by Michael Jordan right now. Stitch is going to try to pull some fucking sick maneuver here. Uh, he's going to try to drive up to the, t the two of them, Michael Jordan and the stormtrooper, 
come to like a skidding stop into this stormtrooper, leaving just enough time for Jordan to pop onto the back of the bike so they could take off. Okay, so you're you're like ramming into the stormtrooper, basically. It's more like drifting into the stormtrooper. Oh shit! Oh no! 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 It goes terribly wrong. <laughs> uh oh. So Stitch, you uh you attempt to pull off a drift, but like you were much more used to the land speeder, and this bike is like has a lot more kick than you were anticipating. <laughs> We just see Michael Jordan dribbling through this this like hail of blaster fire and then like kind of out of focus in the background, you just see Stitch's repulsor bike doing this mad spiral and Stitch has to bail out right before it hits a wall and explodes. <laughs> oh no. All right, Luna, there's one stormtrooper left. What would you like to do? Michael, do we know if these storm why these stormtroopers are attacking us? He says because they're working for doom. I guess that settles it. Yeah, I'm just going to do Incarceris and tie him up. Just leave him for the sand. Oh, no, it's a white. The sand does not eat today. <laughs> <laughs> it looks like it's up to Michael Jordan to save the day. I'm going to throw the basketball. I'm going to throw it really hard at the ground at an angle that will have it bounce right up into his balls. Oh, nice. <laughs> That's a yellow. <laughs> I'm rolling better as Jordan than I have been as Archer. Well, I think we found your new character, Miles. Uh, yeah. Michael Jordan takes out the final stormtrooper. His KD ratio with stormtroopers is astonishingly high right now. <laughs> <laughs> the stormtroopers that had blocked your way have been cleared out. You can still hear the sounds of uh, stormtroopers running through the streets and the uh, sounds of laser fire coming from several blocks away. Reminds you that you are still in a very hostile environment, but you are no longer being blocked from entering the hangar. So what would you like to do? Get in the hangar. Is it open up to us? Yes, uh, it opens. You uh, step into a very large open space. It's basically empty, except for a single gray ship, which is resting on extendable legs. The main body of the ship is about 25 meters long. If you were looking at it from above, it would be roughly the shape of an arrowhead. It has two large fins that sweep out to either side at the rear of the ship. Michael Jordan looks around the mostly empty docking bay and says, this is a good sign. The other ships that the League had are gone, but it doesn't look like they were destroyed. So hopefully this means that at least some of them were able to get away. Okay. Lace, can you drive this? <laughs> uh, Lace slowly looks up at the spaceship and, and, and then she looks back at Luna and gives her this like wide-eyed... Very, very <laughs> slow, like, head shake no. I mean, Stitch, uh, Stitch pulls up in um, a, a space moped that he had to steal from somewhere. <laughs> he had to pull himself out of the wreckage of his little bike and just find another vehicle. Um, but he pulls up and says, oh, me, 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 me. I, I can drive this one, I promise. Michael Jordan says, was that a statement or a question? <laughs> The Stitch is already running into the ship. All right, so you guys uh, pile into the ship and Stitch, you begin firing it up. Morden. Yes. You clenched your eyes shut in anticipation of a, uh, at the very least, painful and possibly fatal impact. But instead of actual pain, the sensation that you experienced was a sudden and dramatic shift of sensory input. It is still fairly hot out, but it's not nearly as hot as it was a second ago. And the air feels a lot more humid all of a sudden. The sounds of desert wind and laser combat have been immediately replaced with like the sounds of life. There's bugs and birds and tree leaves uh, shifting in the wind. Okay. I open my eyes. You are nearly bowled over when you find yourself surrounded by thick jungle foliage. Uh, you are yeah. definitely no longer anywhere near Tatooine, and your friends are nowhere to be seen. Well, you know, I always wondered whether or not heaven was real, and, uh, I mean, this does sort of resemble my homeworld of Sir Kesh, so maybe? <laughs> you look around quickly, and you come upon your next major shock. A short distance away is a single adult Triceratops, watching over a small group of her hatchlings as they graze on low shrubs. Oh, man. <laughs> Oh, God, why? Not here again. <laughs> yeah, so, Morden, uh, you think back over the last few seconds, and you realize that just before you found yourself unexpectedly taken back to Jurassic Park, you felt something inside you spark. Ah! Oh! Ah! Ah! I don't get it. <laughs> yeah, what am, what am I missing here? Uh, oh. Morton's a planeswalker, motherfucker. <laughs> Gosh, wow. Oh, I have so many feelings. 
Uh, I'm just gonna, I guess I'm gonna start looking around for landmarks. I'm gonna like climb a tree. <laughs> yeah, you're definitely seeing the reptilian megafauna of Jurassic Park that you saw before. Off in the distance, you can even see the thatched roof of that large building that you guys had originally met up with uh, Lara Croft's cell in, what seems like a lifetime ago. You're clearly back in Jurassic Park. You do get this weird sensation that you kind of get how you moved here. It was like instinctive, but you're like, I think I might be able to do that again. Mm, I ignore that feeling and bring out the DDC and try to find a nearby extraction point. (laughs) (laughs) I will point out, by the way, the extraction Uh point on Tatooine is in that cave. Oh, I mean, but you can portal hop. I don't think this. I don't think sand dunes are uh, can can hold portals. Actually, you know what? Oh there wait, is there's still, still a portal. portal there. I can. Yeah. I can get back. Yeah, that's true. All right. So you want to oh. hook it to the extraction point then? <laughs> yeah. Uh, no, Dan. I'm I'm refusing to believe that this just happened. So I'm right. I'm just walking to an extraction point. <laughs> All right. So you start heading off through the jungle. Yep. Following the DDC towards an extraction point. Back on Tatooine, Archer and Dante, the two of you have fought your way through the stormtroopers. Like you guys are less than a block away from the other League members who are still hunkered down in an increasingly damaged looking magical force field as blaster fire continues to rain down on them. They look up. Archer, I'm going to say you see in Roland's face a moment of relief and determination when he sees you. And then you see his eyes drift slightly over your shoulder and you see him get suddenly terrified looking. I turn around and shoot it. Coming down the street toward you is a towering vehicle that has a profile uh, similar to a chicken. It has a (laughs) pair of long, thin legs supporting a cube-shaped head, large enough for, like, a few people to fit inside. The head has cannons of different sizes mounted on the sides and the bottom of it, and then there's a pair of armored viewports that resemble dark, shadowed eyes, and the whole thing is made out of dark gray metal. Uh, let's roll initiative, shall we? Seven. Eight. Archer, you're up first, and the ATST is coming. So, uh, Roland, I'm guessing these are not, uh, friendly people. I'm guessing these are, uh, people I should explode. Ka has seen fit to give you a weapon of great power. It'd be a shame to let it go to waste. It's a good point, Roland. It's a good point. <laughs> I like it. I'm taking my turn to aim specifically at one of the, the eyes. All right, very good. Dante, how about you? What are you doing? I would like to kick out one of its knees. So Dante sprints down, and uh, I'm going to need you to make a fighting check, please. That is a green. Dante, you uh, land a jump kick on the side of this thing's leg. So the ATST wobbles slightly under the impact of Dante's kick. Dante, you see the giant head just, like, swivel down and look at you as the guns mounted all on the sides of it also pivot to target you. Uh Uh-oh. The gun on the chin of the vehicle lets loose with a series of staccato double bursts of laser blasts. Dante, you get hit straight on by both. You take 40 damage from that. And then the uh, smaller cannons on the side of the head are also shooting at you. Great. Uh, Those ones, however, miss. And Archer, it is your turn. You now have a nice shot lined up with these viewports. All right, I'm going to spend a car to ignore range penalties on this shot, and I will spend another one to add to the damage once I hit. So that's a green. So that means you did not hit the viewport. Uh, you instead just hit, like, the side of the ATST. Uh, but you're still dealing a fair amount of damage. I am dealing with my high explosive round here 100 points of damage. You don't manage to get it in the viewport. Instead, it just, like, hits, you know, probably, like, a foot or two off to the left, and you basically blow this thing's head off. The entire cube cabin of this just explodes in blackened flaming metal, leaving just a pair of chicken legs standing awkwardly in the middle of the street smoking. Yeah! Damn. You turn around, Roland just sort of, like, watch that happen, looks at you, shakes his head and says, you could have put it in the viewport. I, I know. <laughs> I, tr- I was trying to. Sorry, Roland. At this point, you guys see a ship come flying down low over the buildings. It is shaped like an arrowhead and has a pair of large fins sticking out from the rear of it. The stormtroopers begin to scatter as this thing kicks up a very large amount of wind and dust. Stitch, you are at the helm of this particular ship. What do you guys do? Time to save the day. Uh, well, first of all, Wexter is sitting on the dashboard like the adorable little bobblehead that he is. He is uh, squeaking out a fearsome warning to all the stormtroopers below. <gasps> so brave. 
Does this thing have weapons? And he's, he's just going to start booping and beeping uh, the various things on this dash. You start booping around and uh, eventually you hit a button that uh, apparently like triggers these guns that drop down from the chin of the ship and just begin opening fire indiscriminately all around the area. Uh, Stormtroopers and League members alike have to like duck down under this unexpected laser assault that begins raining down. I think maybe we should try and practice with those before we injure any of our friends. Whoops. (laughs) Stitch is going to stop the auto fire. If we lower some sort of gangplank to get them all on and then we can leave and hopefully I can go down there and maybe Michael, you can come with me and we can hold off the stormtroopers long enough for everybody to get on the ship and then we can go. So Stitch looks at Lace and and he says, it's time. Take the wheel. Lace uh, gets that panic look (laughs) on her face again. Quickly. Yeah, so Lace brings this ship down and uh, lowers the ramp. Basically is like holding it hovering as Stitch, uh, Luna, and Michael Jordan leap off to assist their friends in getting on board and holding off the stormtroopers. Dante and Archer, are you guys uh, doing anything of note now that uh, your escape has arrived? Who's driving that thing? You see a dinosaur in the in the windshield. Uh, God damn it. <laughs> All right, I hop in. I, I turn to, to roll and I'm like, you guys want to ride? He says, uh, well, I wouldn't turn you down. He's, uh, like, clutching his side from where he got winged by a blaster bolt, but uh, he stands up nonetheless, and everyone begins running in to the interior of the ship, climbing up the ramp as they do so. So am I going to make a dramatic last-minute entrance, or is it going to take off before I get back? (laughs) Funny you mention that, uh, Morden. Everyone in the league has climbed aboard this ramp, and it folds back up into the belly and uh, begins lifting off. Just as it does, Morden, you finally emerge from the portal on the side of the building. You turn around and you see this ship. You happen to see just like the corner of Dante's coat disappearing up into the uh, retracting ramp as this thing begins to lift up and the stormtroopers below are firing on it with their blasters. I'm going to use my um, gravity gun to pick up the wreckage of Dante's boombox <laughs> and shoot it at, at the uh, windshield just to like pass the windshield to get their attention. So where have you guys gone now that you are on this ship? Well, I've just uh, shoved Lace out of the cockpit. Okay. <laughs> she looks relieved. <laughs> Lace, you can be co-pilot if you want to. She, she like, just backs away with both of her hands raised. <laughs> no, no, it's, it's just like, you get in that chair. And then, he, and then he grabs her face and says, repeat after me. I am a clever girl. <laughs> <laughs> She's just like, hey, hey, hey. And then, and then sat, and then kind of meekly goes over to the, the co-pilot oh. chair. She she sits there nervously, <laughs> and six-foot-tall Godzilla just, like, walks up behind her and puts a comforting hand on her shoulder. <laughs> By the way, do, do I, so, ship this now? I, I have started <laughs> shipping them, Bob, before this even <laughs> I was, like, shipping them. I don't know them. how I feel. I, uh, I'm trying to figure out these controls, but when I see the, the boombox, I'm like, hey, somebody's throwing trash at us, and I turn toward that direction. <laughs> yeah, uh, you see Morden in the street. I'm, I'm gonna wave. I'm gonna switch my, uh, Omni tool to, like, a, a speaker to, like, increase the volume of my voice, and I say, oh, no, I'm totally fine. Uh, <laughs> go on without me. I'll just catch up with you guys later. I can't believe you guys would forget Morden like this. <laughs> right, are we going back to get him, or am I just going? Like, what's the, what's the verdict here? <laughs> We're definitely going to get Morden. Oh, okay. Okay, just making sure. I just wanted to put it out there. I pop open the door, and then I start flying down toward him. You're trying to scoop him into the ship? Yes. It's just like lacrosse. <laughs> when you put your loudspeaker on Morden, all of the stormtroopers in the street suddenly turn and begin blasting at you, seeing as you are now a much more uh, viable target than this ship, which actually has shields. Do I do I control the guns or does somebody else control the guns? Uh, there are some guns that you control and there are numerous guns that other people have to control. Well, the guns that I control are firing back at those guys. So basically this ship is flying low between the buildings of Mos Eisley. Morden is running from the stormtrooper fire, his shields occasionally flashing as one of them scores a hit. And eventually, Archer, you manage to swoop down, scoop up Morden using the landing ramp and pull him into the ship itself. Right as you do this, you see one of the monitors in front of you light up and you think this is indicating that there are multiple enemy contacts heading your way. Uh, guys, I think we're about to be attacked. You should uh, should have somebody get on those guns. Michael Jordan says, we should probably get out of here. 
Uh, yeah, absolutely. This is your pilot speaking. Uh, I definitely know how to fly this ship, and we are going to... Which direction? It doesn't matter. Just uh, plot a course on the hyperdrive and hit it. That is all I need to know. Get into orbit first, please. Don't do it in an atmosphere. <laughs> oh, oh, well, you should have said that. Fine. Morgan right, says, next up. Go <laughs> up. <laughs> all right, fine. No need to be touchy about it. God. As uh, you begin to head up into orbit, you see that there is suddenly about a half dozen ships that come screaming down from above. They look like basically a single round cabin, just large enough for a single pilot, flanked on either side by vertical wings. There's a round window that looks out from the cockpit, which kind of gives it like the appearance of an eyeball. And all of them begin opening up this rapid fire laser fire at your ship as you are uh, attempting to escape. So Archer is piloting. Does anyone else wish to do anything to assist in your escape. I want to get on the, uh, a gun. Yeah, All right. Luna's gonna go get on a gun even though she doesn't want to. <laughs> You've got this, Luna. Stitch and Morden, are you guys gonna be doing anything or are you just being moral support? I'll get on a gun if there's one free. Stitch is gonna grab um, Dante's guns, go on the outside of the ship and shoot at the <laughs> TIE fighters. All right, great. So basically, I'm going to need those of you that are shooting to make agility checks with a bonus for ranged combat guns. Archer, uh, you need to make an agility check with a bonus for vehicles if you have it. Yellow. Yellow. (laughs) I barely, I scraped a green. Stitch, how you doing? (laughs) Oh boy. I got a green. It's like shooting at spaceships with regular guns. Doesn't it work? <laughs> Are you alright there, kid? <laughs> I got a white, obviously. Alright, great. So, yeah, I, I I picked up from your subtle context, please, that that might have been the case. So, Archer, you begin to uh, put this ship through its paces. You begin to bank and weave around these incoming TIE fighters, evading their fire and trying to get your gunners into position so that they can actually begin to get off some good shots. Dante and Morden are both able to bullseye several TIE fighters. Luna isn't really able to hit any, but she's able to, like, at least fire at them well enough that they have to, like, get out of the way and miss their own shots. Stitch climbs out onto the exterior of the ship and it almost immediately gets torn off by the winds as Archer is like just rolling back and forth. Stitch is immediately realizing that this was an awful idea, even by his standards. Uh, uh, don't put fucking words in my character's brain. This well, is not what he's thinking. That's the conclusion to draw. I'll let you decide if he draws it. Uh, I was just thinking maybe shooting this kind of like crazy atmospheric conditions is maybe not wise, but he has other plans. In any event, Archer is able to zigzag his way up through the atmosphere until eventually you break through and the uh, star-studded expanse of space stretches before you. And you can see, uh, rounding the horizon of this planet, are a pair of... You're not sure how large they are, but then upon realizing how distant they are, you're amending to probably extremely large. Uh, These things are like dagger-shaped, and you can see that many, many more TIE fighters are emerging from them. We should go. Martin's going to say to Michael Jordan, is now a safe time to engage the hyperdrive? He says, if the coordinates are set, which they should be, just go ahead and punch it. Okay. Punch this one. (laughs) So do we need a mass effect relay or... Uh, as you're saying this, Morden, Archer like leans forward on a lever on the control panel, and all of a sudden, all of the stars around you guys stretch out almost infinitely into lines, and then anyone who isn't seated or buckled in is suddenly thrown backwards as this ship leaps forward with impossible speed. Oh my god, Stitch is on the outside of the ship. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Oh yeah, my. Yes. <laughs> Wait, what just happened to Stitch? I was about to ask that question before you did that, and then I went, no, we wouldn't let that happen, would we? (laughs) Is Kit finally going to have to make a new character? (laughs) No, Stitch is seeing into infinity, and it's amazing. (laughs) Yeah, what check does Stitch have to roll for that? (laughs) I'm pretty sure Stitch just saw the time knife. (laughs) (laughs) After, like, a little while, you eventually see that he's now standing and, like, surfing a lot like Teen Wolf. Oh. So the rest of you are inside the ship. (laughs) What are you all doing? I'm giving the remaining two muffins that we had to uh, Skeletor and Bowsette. Skeletor takes the muffin from you, looks down, and we can see from his point of view that a bunch of sand got on one side of it. But then he he looks up at Luna and says, it's perfect. Thank you, Luna. (laughs) I know. (laughs) 
so pure. <laughs> Does Bowsette look at the muffin before I just go hop? I, I imagine she she sniffs it and then uh and then says, little undercooked, and then hits it with some fire breath until it's like <laughs> charred and blackened and says, better, and then takes a bite out of it. Can I walk up to Morden and start poking him? When you walk up to Morden, you see he's fiddling with the DDC, like um he has a little panel open on the back, and, and he's like fiddling with some of the wiring inside of it. And then he he looks over his shoulder and says, Yes, Dante, can I help you? Can you can you feel that? Yes. Does it hurt? Is this the setup to some pickup line or something? <laughs> no, it's just a yes or no question. Does it hurt? No. Would it hurt if it was a laser beam? I imagine so. If you're referring to that strange incident we experienced a little while ago, I assume it must have been some sort of malfunction of the DDC. There's nothing else I can think of that would make sense to explain it. The other League members are kind of sitting nearby, and Laura Croft looks up and says, what happened? Uh, it's under investigation. Don't say anything, uh, Morden. <laughs> Please direct all your questions to me. I am Morden's <laughs> representation. I can vouch for that. <laughs> we, there were some stormtroopers firing at us, and suddenly I vanished. Morden's I found a myself, space god. <laughs> I found myself transported to Jurassic Park. I assume it must have had something to do with the DDC malfunctioning. I didn't know that we were at an extraction point at the time, but it's possible there was some minor dimensional rift or something going on. We know that these crossover events have been happening more and more frequently lately, so it's not completely out of the question. I rest my case. Geralt is looking at you strangely and he says, Yeah, yeah, that could have been it. There is another possibility, though. We know that there are people that can just do that, and we've been looking for people like that for a while now. What do you, what do you mean, people who can do that? Planeswalkers. I think Space God sounds better, but whatever. I still have some diagnostics to run on this thing. I'll, I'll get back to you. <laughs> you know, there's one easy way we could test it. And that is? Well, apparently only Planeswalkers can read that book. Can I finish running these diagnostics first? <laughs> I really think this is a promising theory. <laughs> Morden, we've been looking for someone to read this book. If you look at it and it's gibberish, then fine. Run whatever diagnostics you want. But this is kind of important. All right. Give me the stupid book. I believe Luna had the tome. Because Luna grabbed the tome and the four oh, yes. gems, correct? Luna pulls it out of her bag and hands it over to Morden. Yeah, Morden, you take the book in your hands. You'd looked in this book before, and what you saw was just some incomprehensible alien language. Like, neither the translator that you had from your homeworld, nor the Phyrexian translator were able to make heads or tails out of it. You're still seeing the same glyphs on this page, but now you actually understand what they are. So, Morden's magic? Space God, but yes. Well, this is an interesting data point. <laughs> I am going to start reading it. You start looking through this thing. As he is doing so, uh, the rest of you see a small flickering blue holographic figure form in midair. And uh, despite the relatively low resolution of the image, you can immediately recognize this as Elijah Snow. And he says, I can't tell you how thankful I am to see all of your ugly faces. Aww. Hey Ow. boss, that color looks really good on you for some reason. Our Tatooine headquarters got hit by Imperials a few days ago, and most of the League got taken prisoner. The rest of the Imperials must have just been waiting at that base to see if anyone else would show up, and, well, you all were the lucky ones. Only a handful of us managed to escape this raid, but we left the ship that you're on, the Minoc, behind just in case anyone else from our group happened to uh, jump to Tatooine in the meantime. When I saw that the ship had been activated, I was hoping it was you and not some Imperials that had found it. What's, uh, what's going on over there? We think. Um, Morden, do you want to tell him? Yeah, there's a, there's a chance I might be a planeswalker. Really? That would be immensely helpful. So we're on an extreme time crunch at this point. Our intelligence indicates that Doom has very nearly finished construction of this ultimate weapon that he's been building that he can use to destroy universes. From what it sounds like, he had developed time travel technology back in his home world, and he's used that in this world to pull all sorts of weapons and resources and people from different time periods, which he's been using in this giant project of his. So I recognize that finding the final gemstone may indeed be critical to our overall plan of defeating Phyrexia, but we also need to start mounting an attack on this super weapon in the meantime, which 
as you can imagine, is more difficult now, given that most of the League have been taken captive, and we don't have a ton of resources at this point. The five of you are probably the most experienced and competent heroes that we have at this point. I can brief you on what needs to be done. We can split you up and have you take different teams of the remaining leaguers on specific missions so that we can set up our final push against Phyrexia. With all of you leading us, we might just stand a chance of winning this thing once and for all. So at this point, you guys hear a hatch close somewhere on the ship, and Stitch comes in through a door. His hair is completely, like, swept backwards. There is not a (laughs) single hair that is not facing backwards. Um, And he walks up to Dante and throws him back his guns, and he says, Your guns don't work. (laughs) <laughs> Can't even shoot a ship. They never have. <laughs> uh, Stitch kind of surveys the room, and he's just like, did something happen? So, Morden, you have finished looking through the tome and uh, translating some of the more salient passages in it, and uh, you've discovered a few key facts. First of all, you found the location of the final gemstone. Cool. The book doesn't specifically name the plane, but it does describe a location in the multiverse that you think you can reach. You can even make the calculations to figure out how to program the DDC to get you there. That's thing number one that you find out, is where the final gemstone is. Thing number two that you find out is that the word gemstone is actually a not quite accurate translation of what these things are. The much closer translation you think would be container. Ooh. Okay. Container for what? Now that you're looking at them, you actually realize that there's a slight seam running around the equators of them. (gasps) It's a Pokeball. (gasps) (gasps) Or an egg. Maybe an egg. He says looking at uh, the dinosaurs. Does it seem like I could open it? Yes, you think you can. I I start flipping through book. Does this seem like a good idea? Or is this like destroy the entire ship in a fiery explosion if I open it kind of thing? No, it sounds like it it was just designed to keep whatever's inside safe, but not to protect other people from it. Let Lace sit on one. Lace, (laughs) put your butt on this. I'm going to take, if you want to pick a color, that's fine, Dan. I was going to go for the green one because that was the first one we got, but. That's fine with me. Okay, I'm going to take that one. I would say, so it looks like this thing might be able to open. How do you guys feel about that? Do it. All right, Morden uh, cracks it open. Inside, there is a gold ring set with a green stone that's designed to resemble a globe. Are these fucking planet's earrings? Maybe. Extraordinary League is produced by Dan Mulcairn, with logo design by Claire Mulcairn. Special thanks to Kevin McLeod at Incompetech.com for our theme song, Motherload, and to TabletopAudio.com for our background music and ambient sound effects. You can find us on Twitter at Smash Fic Podcast and search for the Smash Fiction Podcast on Facebook, Tumblr, and YouTube. Subscribe on Apple Podcasts or your podcatcher of choice, and if you leave us a good review, we shall become more powerful than you can possibly imagine. Smash Fiction is made possible thanks to our supporters on Patreon at patreon.com slash smashfictionpodcast. Please consider donating as little as a dollar each month. It helps us keep the show going, and we have great rewards and extra content for those who help us out. If you have any suggestions, feedback, or other contributions, send them to us at smashfictionpodcast at gmail.com and help us continue the fight. Their accuracy is actually better when the officers are around. Is that, like, from analysis of film, or did you just decide that? Uh, that's just what I decided. <laughs> Some kind of D&D pack tactics shit. That's why they're yeah. all... I mean, you never see any officers around in the movies, right? It's just usually much stormtroopers. Thus, ergo... <laughs> Therefore... Were they more confident around, like, uh, Phasma? Is that a thing we could look at? I mean, they're more turned on. Anyway, <laughs> more turned I mean, on. yeah... <laughs> I don't know if that would help them or hinder them, to be honest. I will point out, Michael Jordan never is not holding his basketball. Like, <laughs> okay. anytime he walks around, he's always dribbling the basketball. <laughs> I mean, that that is in character. He doesn't yeah. travel. Now, you know? No, I'm he like, doesn't travel. How did, how did he drive the car over there? That's my uh, question. He was so that's why Stitch the, drove. He, was, oh, he, oh. he could have been dribbling, like, on the passenger seat. <laughs> no, but he got that, that hover thing over to the cave where he was hanging out. He was just, like, spinning it on one finger while he's driving. That's how good he is, Bob. That's true. Jeez.